Well, uh, madam, what to say about her? She is the director, center of IVF and human reproduction at Gangaram Hospital. And she is brilliant at it. I think uh, uh, if I start reading everything, it's going to be uh, uh, taking away all the time. She's got the president's medal. She is responsible for the first IVF baby born in North India. She was awarded from the DMA on B.C. Roy's birthday, Outstanding Contribution to Medicine. She's had a Lifetime Medical Excellence Award, OBS and Gaini by Hippocrates uh, Foundation 2014. She's had the Abdul Kalam Gold Medal uh, in 2015 and Rashtriya Gaurav Gold Medal Award in 2017 by Global Economic Progress and Research Association. She's a Distinguished Teacher of Excellence uh, Award by uh, PG Medical Education by ANBAI and NBE 2017. She was icon of IVF of North India. I think it's a hat trick, isn't it, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, she was uh, consecutive years. She's been at it for three consecutive years. She's got the best integrated national team of IVF and most coveted award as the National IVF Champion of the Year 2019. And she's a course director for postdoctoral fellowship in reproductive medicine by NBE since 2007. So do you wake up to this uh, achiever? That's Dr. Mm -hmm. Abha. Much accomplished, much celebrated. It's always a pleasure interacting with you, madam. Your zeal, your organized approach, and your grasp of the subject is exemplary. Tell us something about your journey. <laughs> uh, your younger <laughs> days, uh, where, where did you start your MBBS from? And, you know, oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Well, um, I did have a little difficult childhood, but a very happy childhood too. I lost my father at the age of uh, 11 and a half. And uh, we were three sisters and one brother who was just three and a half year old. So my mother was a non-working mother and we had no way but to go back to the ancestral house of my father, which is a third tier city of Uttar Pradesh, Farukhabad. And... Wow. Uh, I was, uh, I studied in a school called Kanodia Balika Vidyale. And then Doesn't I went, matter where you come from. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and then I went to do my 9, 10, 11, 12 from the only school which had science as a subject and they allowed girls to come there. It was probably a girls school. So I did my 12 from there. We used to have no teachers for six months. We used to sit on mats on the floor and uh, well that that is history now but um, yeah I... but then physics became difficult for me in those days now physics is absolutely difficult very very difficult today but in those days also uh, the concept of television and the uh, rays going into television was difficult for us to understand so i had a person who tutored me for 20 days uh, he was Professor N.P. Singh. I still remember him very fondly. My mother used to be very angry that he's supposed to teach for one hour and he comes and he goes away in 30, 40 minutes. So she used to say that he's, he's not giving his full due. Well, later on when he was asked, he said, oh, she understands what I have to explain. So I don't need to stay any longer. So it and started. He, I did my PMT, got selected in Agra. Then my journey started there. Agra was easy. I, I did need a scholarship from a charitable trust to do my studies. At that time, the scholarship used to be 100 rupees a month. My expense was 125 rupees. So 25 rupees my mother used to give me. I mean, she had three more children to feed, you know. I mean, my elder sister and a younger sister and a brother. And she was not working and there was no source of income. So this was... But we enjoyed every minute. We used to love each other. We used to assist each other. And I used to, you know, wow. I was like the delicate one doing drawings, paintings, decorating my house. Because my mother lived in really good conditions till my dad was alive. Yeah. But then he was gone. There was no earning member. There was no money which he kept for anyone. He never thought he'll go as early as at 50 years of age. So it was. Anyways, medical college was um, it was frightening for me to start with I got selected in Lady Harding's but Delhi used to frighten me so much being a very timid UP girl so I never came to Lady Harding's 
then they had only one seat for a non Delhiite student. And I, my name was there because in 12th class, I topped the UP district. Wow. So the marks were, <laughs> marks were good. Lovely. Yeah. Anyway, the brain the, behind it was good. Yeah. And, then, the and then, you know, what happened because I was used to learning on my own, never had tutors. So MBBS never appeared very difficult to me. And um, well, by the end of it, I was known by my whole batch because I sort of went on topping after the first professional, every profession. Wow. And um, at the end, there were so many medals I got that the chancellor who had come to give Karan Singh Ji, he said, don't go up the stage. I was very, very thin, maybe 42, 43 kgs. He said, stand on the stage. You're losing a lot of calories going down and coming up. <laughs> yeah, that my was God, it really... wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all. It gave me goosebumps just listening to it. I and, can imagine and, what you must be And going. I had no one, no one there who came there on my convocation because my mother could not have traveled. It was expensive to come from Farukhabad to Agra. So my younger sister who studied in Agra, in Agra, um, Agra College, she was doing her MSc. She was the one who was there to clap for me. And um, it was lovely though. I loved every moment of it. I used to shun my very good friends because I used to think that, you know, they deserve to be first and I am first. So they'll feel bad about me. <laughs> so one day, the one who talked wow. in the profession that boy caught hold of me and said why do you keep running away when you see us coming into the ward I said because I think that you felt very bad that you know I've got more marks than you <laughs> I was so stupid I was I so thought, scared yeah. but then but I've grown way. so much Punita when I look yeah. back I see I have grown from where a very timid girl I I should have put up a letter written by a colleague of mine whom I met just about two three months ago who lives in US he said, I still remember that timid girl in a white salwar kameez, always trying to go at the back of the class. But uh, and afraid look of at you now. Anyone, wow. uh, facing anyone would raise her hand very timidly, half hand up, because she knew that all the others were duffers who were answering and maybe she knew the right answer. <laughs> uh, one wow. surgery professor uh. gave me 96 out of 100 in a surgical pre-test in third year where surgery was not my subject. And there was so much of furor from everywhere. How could a student get so many marks? And it yeah, was like, it was, it was very nice, that journey, you know. And then he didn't know who this girl was. And everybody was taking the names of the more popular people. And he said, the name is from A, but I don't remember. So that is my early journey. Let's start my new journey. Wow. So what brought you to input? It was a new subject. Uh, yeah, but, uh, see, I, I, uh, I come. I told you that I come from a very respected family, but unfortunately, because of my father's demise, we were like very hand to mouth type of a family. But I, I give all the credit to my mother, who always wanted all of us to study. And today, my I did medicine and MS. My younger sister did MSc and she was pursuing her PhD when she got married. Then she went away to USA, did her master's in taxation there. My brother did his, uh, he did his engineering from Kharagpur and he's also absolutely self-made. I just gave one year to him to study when he plunked two subjects in class eight. So I left my internship from Agra, went and stayed in Farukhabad and we used to, our our time used to be three to eight. We used to study. I used to reach home at three o'clock from the district hospital and I used to teach him. And probably that made his concept so clear that today, like he is one of the leading scientists and engineer in the US uh, doing Wonderful. very well. So all of us studied because of my mom. And, and then anyways, I came back to Delhi. I had gone to Libya in between because my husband also didn't have any financial support from his family, neither did I. And we got an opportunity to go to Middle East. Those days in 1980s, Middle East was like on the height. That just go there, money, yeah. have money, come back so that you can at least start your life. I missed out on doing my senior residency because of this. Because Does it matter we, now? <laughs> uh, so 
I, I just did a job in railways for two years so that we could, you know, sort of be on our own. Had my first child, Gaurav. And then we went away to Libya. But five years was enough over there. I told my husband, this is no place for growth. You need to go back. We'll get stagnated. Because my friends have lived there 40, 45 years. Five years, we were back. First February 87, I joined Gangaram and then Dr. Bhandari, I'll give her a lot of credit, you know, at that time, we used to have just one infertility clinic Thursdays. And she said, would you like to do it? I said, yeah, I had had no idea, good damn idea of what. So all I used to do is a semen analysis in the lab, a post test and using clomiphene. Okay. Ultrasound was just emerging in 87, the follicle monitoring was just starting then. And I had no idea, good damn, what is this follicle monitoring coming back from Libya? So I went and got all the books, everything to find out what is this? And then I would sit with Deepak Chavla and we would formulate that, that ultrasound monitoring, which, we is, which is so popular today all over. We made yeah. that chart yeah. and we said, let us have on a date wise thing. So from there we started, 87 I joined. 88, Dr. Kocher joined. And after she joined, she was interested in infertility. And then Dr. Bhandari asked me in 89, do you want to switch over to infertility? IVF is growing all over the world and also in India because 86, our first baby of India was born, baby Harsha in Bombay. Yeah. This was 88, 89. And she said, we need to do something in Delhi. Are you ready to go into it? I was a fool. I said, yes. I am ready. You are not a fool. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Kutwani told me, Mar jayegi, obstetrician hai. you are leaving obstetrics. I was asked to leave obstetrics, gynecology, and yeah. give, give wholehearted support to uh, developing IVF. We started it in 89-90 when we hired Dr. Gore. See, what we did was innovation. What is happening now is competition. Now there is so much competition that you have to go over it and the only way to go over it is ethical practice yeah. good ethical scientific practice not really the fancy practice right. we have to be truthful to ourselves and to our patients at that time it was innovation like laparoscope in dr kocher used to aspirate a follicle and say run downstairs to that lab where dr god is sitting let her identify her egg and dr right. god was a brilliant scientist from Ames who had worked on animal oocytes. She had never seen a human oocyte. So she learned to identify the human oocyte. Wow. And um, we started our lab. We used to make our own culture media because no culture media was available. Dr. Gore used to make it and she was brilliant at it. She would triple distill water, use it, make media. Yes, we were... Someone asked me when we started IVF and had our first IVF baby in 1991, who taught you IVF? Yeah. I said, my guru <laughs> is fertility, sterility and human reproduction. These two journals were our gurus. We used to sit down and there were only hard copies at that time. No internet, no Google, no phones. There were no mobile phones also. So yeah, that was yeah. a guru we used to learn the protocols and where did we get our GNRH agonist from? This Dr. Kocher said, Abha, if we have to do IVF, we will use the agonist protocol. You get it from somewhere. And we found out Suk Sagar chemist in Bombay. Bombay people yeah. were using it. So we started get asking Narayan Das to get it for us. We used to get Busserli. Right. We used the long Gosh. protocol with ease. I remember after the first baby, Next year, we had five children. After that, next year, we had 11. And then wow. the numbers went on growing from that. And now our pregnancy rates for last month are almost 68% with a single blastocyst transfer in frozen embryo transfer cycle. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. So you just uh, self-taught yourself and equipped yourself to master all aspects of infertility. That is what you're trying to say? One, yeah, one day Dr. Kocher sent me to Dr. Sadna Desai in Mumbai because Mumbai was a leader in IVF. No, Dr. Hinduja had already created the first baby with Dr. T.C. Anand's help. And Dr. Sadna Desai was doing and she was a friend of Dr. Kocher. So she said, you go see how she does the pickups and all. So I was there for two days. 
lovely experience, very nice person, very good environment. And she would do the pickup and then tell me, it's easy, lagta hai na? Itna easy hota nahi hai, jitna hum jab kar rahe to lagta hai. And those two days I uh, saw her doing and rest was fertility, sterility mainly and human reproduction a little bit because those articles were a little high. Fertility, sterility was absolutely for a layman like me. And that was our teaching. We followed the protocols. We did the test. There was no AMH then. There was no enteral follicle count. The transvaginal resolution was not so good, but we did have transvaginal ultrasound. That is why we could start IVF. Right. So, so, but there was no tussle about being in a private uh, hospital or a medical college, or the management was supporting. And Dr. Bhandari, of course, was the main. Uh, I think she she was she was the main push. You know what she told was, you have to leave gynae and obs, which I did mildly. But I couldn't leave everything because surgery is my passion. You know, how yeah. I love surgery, I only know. Nobody yeah. knows me as an endoscopist, endoscopist surgeon, but I think I enjoy most doing endoscopies <laughs> and endoscopies uh, and hysteroscopies. So I didn't give up my surgery fully. Obstetrics, yes, the general OPD went, the casualty went. I never got anything from these two yeah. places. But by the time the first IVF baby was born, I was in Gangaram for five years. And um, somehow, luck or God's grace, yeah. I, people were coming to me for obstetrics and I did not give that part up. Those right. who would come to me directly and I would take up obstetrics. There was one point of time before IVF, I used to do five open hysterectomies a day. Wow. With okay. Dr. Kutcher uh, coming later and then joining in and we would do... I mean, a lot of open hysterectomies. But then to give up, everything was not easy, Punita. You yeah. know, to say no, that I will not do anything. So I did give up to some extent, but then I took a second attachment very soon, 92. Okay. And over there I started doing a little surgery. And I was asked, why do you go there to do? I said, what do you do? What do I do in my Kali time? <laughs> I sit in the library for some time. Rest of the time, I need, I'm a surgeon. I'm a gynecologist obstetrician I need to do so yeah. I kept doing that a little bit but then yes I was wholeheartedly devoted to developing yeah. infertility so it was not just IVF it yeah. was infertility as a whole even endoscopy right for yeah, they go hand in hand. They go hand I never do a TLH but I can do all fertility enhancing myomectomies beautifully and I encourage my whole unit to do that because when you are treating your own patient endoscopically, then you are always very cautious about how much ovary you are losing, how much uterus you are damaging in a myomectomy or adenomyomectomy. Will this patient be able to withstand a pregnancy till term if you've done a surgery on the uterus? So these are the aims which I think we all need to look for and not just leave them alone. I'm sure all the endoscopic surgeons are good. But you have to yeah, identify the, the, the infertility uh, friends. Keep goading them not to disturb too much about the AMH, yeah. not to destroy yeah. the ovary. Leave the myometrium alone. Leave the endometrium alone. Yes. Taba, what were the major hurdles uh, that you overcame apart from being a pioneer and starting up the speciality? Uh, do you think there was something uh, which uh, you would have done differently or you would have thought uh, differently uh, retrospectively? You know what, Punita, uh, somehow, you know, somebody asked me, they wrote a biography and they asked me, do you have any regrets? And I said, none. Because when I look back, I think, you know, I was a person who never needed much or I never, like, I have no expectations. So whatever came, I was so happy at it that wow. when we had a lab in two nursing home rooms. I was happy about it. When we got a lab, which was better than that, I'm still happy about it. I'm very proud of my IVF lab. This lab has electrical points to everything. Yeah. Me and one of my colleagues, Dr. B.K. Rao, we sat and we designed. And I'm extremely happy about how things happened. Yes, there were hurdles. There were times when I was asked, don't do this, do this, don't do that. I, I used to be just quiet and move out and continue to do what I thought was right. So right. all I was what I thought was right. Right. So so the major decisions work for you. 
and you just went with the flow and worked your uh, very exactly. very hard i never had any goals in life never had any goals it's very bad to say for a person at my stage but my this- god look at you the kind of achievements you made with no goals wow <laughs> i i only thought that today is a day which i have to do my best and every day i would strive to do my best and that is all goals kept on appearing and i kept on crossing those goals they crept up and i did try to do my best that day and the goal was like sort of crossed and another goal came up it came up on its own i never looked forward i never looked forward to anything in life anything wow. you Just, make it sound like a video game you make it sound like a video game <laughs> come up block, overcome a block next block overcome that yes. block Yeah, exactly. Okay. This is how it has been. So, um, I am sure there were a lot of hurdles. There were sure there were sleepless nights. I am sure I remember that how I would wake up thinking, how can I leave everything and just get into IVF, which has not succeeded anywhere in North India, not even in Ames, you know. And they closed down. What right. will happen? So, yeah. I do. I did have those nightmarish nights, and then one morning I woke up. and my husband said go ahead and do what your heart is saying just don't think ki kya hoga whether it will work or not i'm right. sure things will work so i don't say there were no hurdles or there were no fears i was i i'm a very fearful person i get afraid very easily i i'm very timid but now i'm not i feel yeah. i'm not so timid that's why you I'm overcome not, so much you overcome yeah, so much yeah, yeah, exactly right. exactly yeah So uh, this is all about it. I feel, I feel that everyone should not really. Yes, you should have a dream, and it is a daytime dream and not a sleep while a dream. And you should, whatever comes your way on that day, do your best, and you will naturally walk more and more towards your dream. But if you look up very high and you try a elevator there, there is no elevator to success. there is only a staircase to success it goes slowly it took me 40 years to reach here started but what a position seven. what a position now what a position now tell me something doctor abba did you take any decision any mis decision uh, that you regret or proved costly to you in your own uh, head up there anything I, that uh, you. you said no right I don't think because you know when IVF was flourishing a lot, a lot of new centers were opening up. I was approached by so many people to leave Gangaram, and you know I would be made someone very great if I develop their center, and I would be made uh, head of the whole regional area or northern India of the centers. And I'm very happy I did not give in to any of these um, these uh, offers. i i think money is a number game at you need money till some uh, point. point and we all need that money to live happily to you know get what we want and to do things which we like to do after that it's all in the bank all what comes yeah. to you so much money is gone to the bank where do we spend that money where is the time to spend it neither in clothes nor in jewelry nor in traveling if i travel my work will suffer if i buy a lot of clothes where will i wear them and well re uh, i mean i i bought whatever i wish to but i still feel that money is now a number game and a time is coming for at least me to do all i wouldn't say charity this is not charity at all but i would want that i do my what my responsibility is towards society that i start seeing patients without charging anything however ivf is a expensive technology so that i do not know what can happen but a stage in my life has come where i would think that i would want to repay back to the society about how much i got i mean it's like so much more than what i have or what i had that i've got that time yeah. to repay the society has come i am trying to do lot it's of things full circle have, do you know i opened up a education trust on my mother's name in 2013 when she died Wow. and now a lot wow. of girls are getting scholarship from that and for sure agra medical college i tried to the nail for 5 years to include include 
one girl every batch to get the Daya Agarwal uh, Education Trust. I didn't have the word charitable trust because I got a scholarship from a charitable trust. The word charitable always hurt me. So I used to always hide that I get this scholarship. But I feel if you get it from an education trust, it feels more easy to accept it. So now Agra Medical College, first year after her first semester exam, there is a, a committee of four people who sit down and look into the girl who is the weakest economically and has done best in the exam. She gets a scholarship for the rest of the four years. So, Wonderful. so Wonderful. every year girl is added. And this is like my way of um, doing something. Yeah, giving back. And plus other things also. But then, yes, now the time has come. I'm 70 now. You don't look <laughs> I just retired last year in November and was made emeritus consultant. Congratulations. Uh, that the word retired doesn't suit on you, ma'am. <laughs> so, so now the time has come that I need to only give back and not take anything more with me. You're a self-made person, right, Dr. Abba, what we gather from all this. And but tell me one thing: Do you is it necessary to have godfathers and godmothers? Mentors are necessary. No. Uh, no. You see, anyone who asks me, is there a teacher whom you you know uh, remember very well or have a lot of respect? Yes, there are. But I don't think they were all shaping me during my studies the way it is. But I think I was shaped in a way how I grew up in my family. And that I think maybe was genetic or that was uh, came up through my family. Um, Conditioning. Atmosphere and the close-knit family we were. My sister got married after my father's death within four years, but then three of us were like sitting like this together. Uh, I can remember no birthday celebration for me ever. Wow. Except when we three were together with my mom, there was one birthday celebration but three of us together because we're all November born, 12, 16, 17. Okay. With one bottle of Coke and lots of Golgappas between the three <laughs> of us. So, you know, these are such beautiful memories that I don't regret this at all. Now the birthday celebrations are like, wow. But I remember that more fondly than anything which I have now. I think adversity has made you what you are. You, you just steal yourself to all the tough situations. And you just uh, put your head down and uh, big headed through the whole uh, blockage that uh, the people, the environment was creating for you. And just you strode away to your position wherever you are with a lot of hard work and tenacity. So I think Dr. Uh, Bhandari did uh, a very, the family. Dr. Bhandari had a very astute eye, I think. Why did she put me with this responsibility? Probably she asked others also and she asked me and I said, yeah, I'll do it. Like a stupid fool, I did not know what was IVF. I learned, I read, I did everything. But she asked me and I said yes. So, so what are, what are I, the key I points? give a mark to her. Yeah. Knowing your, what are the key points for establishing practice and what are the must-haves? in, in uh, Must-have is, one is education. Right. You ha must have the knowledge and use the knowledge pragmatically. You, you cannot do what someone else is doing and say, oh, it's being done that way. I will also do that. Use your own knowledge pragmatically. What you've read, just apply it into practice. It will work better than what others are doing. So what brings that clarity of thought? I've attended your lectures. I've attended your talks. I've attended your orations. And you come out so crystal clear. What is the secret behind that clarity? Yeah, I wish I knew. I, I think, you know, uh, I'll tell you small examples. Like we used to always have a thought that we must catch the peritoneum when we open up our incision and take a suture over it. Yes, that is maybe correct. But I thought in laparoscopy, we make holes and we just leave them. We don't close the peritoneum. Then why are we jumping into the abdomen to get over it? If it's not bleeding, you just close it even a centimeter below, it will have no problems. Right. Then I See my teachers throwing away arteries saying, ye kharab ho gaya, ye kharab ho gaya. yet when they wanted us to hold the needle and pull out, they would say, artery uthao, why not another needle holder? Because needle holder has a metal 
they're holding capability so it will have bristles and yeah. if our artery holds the needle we will make it uneven and it will cut the sutures when we try to hold the sutures with the artery so you know i used to think and i used to apply things like yeah. petrosin i started petrosin and now i do it even in open myomectomies I then i started using e for petrosin i think my first petrosin was your patient yeah and then now i use petrosin in all uh, placenta previas my colleagues tell me my juniors tell me why don't you publish this method we've not yeah. had to give a bottle of blood to any placenta previa but um, exactly. i give it because i feel once the baby is out i can give lots of petrosin stop all the bleeding and suture my uterus back so it's just this that you think and you apply it you think and you apply it it works right right good yeah it, it's work for you and it's work for everyone else it will, also it will so what message would you like to give to the youngsters in intending to walk your path one is no elevators only a staircase knowledge is very important acquire knowledge and then work on it don't look at others and copy they may be doing something wrong you would do something right and uh, perseverance is very important hard work is very important these are the three mantras knowledge perseverance and hard work wow everything put together and that's dr abha for you thanks a lot for sparing your valuable time thank you punita for, for bringing this. out all the emotional things from me and i never I knew what to, what to ask, ask. no yeah that, that that i didn't intend to and i'm sure you can take it up spontaneously you are no longer that timid girl that was raising yeah, up yeah and yeah and you can face any situation in life and these are just questions about being as successful and as uh, progressive as you are in your work capacity and your establishing uh, guidelines and uh, you know you are quite a path breaker considering uh, what you've been through and you had nothing to work on and you just started from the beginning from scratch so to say and built yourself uh, look at the situation that you are in now and i'm sure you'll be happy looking back what you did yes uh, uh, without any one support and you just stood there uh, doggedly and another milestone in my life was my son doing embryology i picked him out from biotechnology and sent him we need very good embryologist in this country for ivf to do well and once embryology right. grew, our ivf results will be at par with the whole world you are giving us 68% my god that's phenomenal that also you need to publish madam and that I, with a single embryo transfer this is not two embryos being transferred anywhere so absolutely yeah last month yeah so full right. well, ma'am thank you so much thank you for all the pearls of wisdom your precious time and apologies for the delay that we took in starting initially because of the thank you so much ma'am have a go- great you, evening Punita. and good night thank you punita for giving was- me this opportunity to talk about myself and uh, no 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 it was regarding your journey how hard you work to be where you are now and it it inspires people if it inspires people see you started with nothing there are people saying hamare paas ye nahi hai ye nahi hai ye nahi hai you had nothing and yet you reached the top of the mountain and you are still staying there with all your hard work and who says you are retired no one will even even agree to what you are saying that you are retired <laughs> you're as happy as ever and yeah. um, thanks a lot the forest are dark dreary and deep and we have miles our promises to go to go, keep and miles to go before we sleep uh, so there's still a long pathway left <laughs> let's see okay sure. thank you thank you kind of uh, receive your achievements by and by as you go by at 70 you are not stopping i can understand that Thank you. I, I will stop at some time surely within the next few years <laughs> on your time ma'am on your terms that's okay and by that time yeah. you will have achieved much much more in leaps and bounds i'm sure and i'll that. probably continue to teach and continue yeah. to see patients but maybe surgery i will stop at some time oh, oh that'll be a loss to the surgery <laughs> <laughs> no no you, people like you are there you will uh, you are a damn good endoscopic surgeon and i'm sure you'll do a lot of justice to people Thank you. Require endoscopy for your kind words and the encouragement. Thank you for having. Uh, okay. I mean, a lot for being there. Thank you. Okay, Punita. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. Good night, Deepika. Good night. Good night.